G'day. Welcome to this time together. As we gather, hear the words of the psalmist, the opening verse of Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. At the start of our day, at the start of a task, at the coming together for this time of worship, hear the wisdom of the psalmist. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Knowing his love, give thanks as you start what you do. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we do indeed give thanks for the love that you have shown us, particularly in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love and the life that we receive through him. For you are indeed good. Good in ways that we cannot be. Good in ways that our mere words are a massive understatement. You are God. You are creator of all that is. You are powerful and gentle. You. Jesus says, our Abba, Father. So we come before you now in this time, connected in many places, many times, by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Christ. We come to worship, to honour, to adore, and to hear your voice speak to us. So reveal yourself to us, we pray. Crack our hard hearts, open our minds, release us from the prisons that we create for ourselves, that we might worship you in truth and holiness. To you be your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's sing together. Peace. 
I once heard a, a fella who asked the question, does anybody care if I care? Can I fake care? Can I pretend to care? Do I have to really care? It's an interesting concept. And sometimes in our culture we say we fake it until we make it. And sometimes in our walk of faith when we find it hard to see God, we nevertheless practice the things of God, believing that in and through that, God will reveal God's self. There is a challenge to us though. That our God cared. Our God cared so much that he came, lived the hardship of this life and died on a cross for love of us. That's the level of care our God has. I wonder sometimes whether we in the church have lost the sense of what it is to sacrificially care for others. What it is to inspire others to care for those around them. What it is to love those that are not being loved. Jesus, we see, is again and again criticised for who he hangs out with, for who he spends time with. And yet in our churches, so often we are condemnatory about those who spend time with others outside the church. I remember some very judgmental things being said about a minister who used to go and sit in the pub. Now, this said minister used to have a quiet beer or two while he was in the pub. But I know from the quiet stories I heard, that in that space, this minister made huge connections with people who would never grace the doors of our church, would never come into the holy buildings, would never even see themselves as part of that community, but knew that they had been loved, they had been cared for, that they had been valued, because of the time he gave them. And it makes me wonder when I hear that criticism of people saying, oh, but he wasn't visiting church people. Well, church people are already in the network. Surely, if church people are doing what church people ought to be doing, then church people are being cared for by church people. Even when the calling is to go beyond the church. What does it mean to care? To really care for others. I heard a commentator, speaking about giving money to beggars in the street. The commentator was quite condemnatory of both those who were living rough and those who supported them. It made me wonder, of all the people I've known over the years who have found themselves living rough at some point in time, how would that commentator go if they were in that space? If the things that had happened to those on the streets had happened to him? Friends, wherever we look, there are people in need of care, of love. Are we, you and I, willing to care enough to make a difference in the lives of those around us? Let's pray. 
Loving Father God, in these days, we see much heartache and much struggle. We see many who are hurting, many who are fearful, many who are battling their own demons, figuratively and literally. Lord, it is very easy to become overwhelmed with the magnitude of the task. And perhaps we would do well to remember that it's not our responsibility to solve all the problems of the world because you are the salvation of the world. That it's not our responsibility to worry for all the cares of the world. Because the love that you have is all sufficient. It is our opportunity and our calling as people who walk in the way of Jesus to care for those that you, God, place around us. And so we pray this day. We pray for the ones we know who are battling, for those whose bodies, mind and soul are in need of healing. We pray for the hurting. Come, Holy God. Come in power, we pray. Pour out your spirit. Bring your healing and your hope. Enfold those who grieve and ache this day with your love. Lift up those who are downtrodden. Set free those who are held prisoner to their past, to their present, to the voices in their head and their heart, to the voices around them. Set free all those who are held back, Lord God. For we know that you are good, that your steadfast love endures and that you want us to experience life to the full. So we would see the words of the psalmist fulfilled, the thirsty satisfied, the hungry filled with good things. Those in darkness finding light. Those bound finding freedom. We would pray that all people might be able to tell of your good works and sing songs of joy. For you are sovereign. Come, Holy God, show us the renewal and the restoration of the whole of creation. To you be your glory, honour, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing.
let's hear from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And so the disciples are gathered. They've heard the stories. They know of the reputed Jesus alive. And he appears among them and he says, Peace be with you. And they're not all that peaceful or peaceable. They're troubled. What is going on? What is our reality in this space? Jesus says, peace be with you. The offer of his peace, the challenge to seek peace. And here in this passage, we hear and see a great wisdom. Jesus offers his hands. Just check it out, boys. It's the real deal. He asks for food and consumes it, proving that he is not a ghost. What he is saying to them is, this is how you find peace in this moment. You test what you see. You seek the truth. So look at the wounds. Watch me eat and you will know that I am not a ghost. And that is a great witness to us. To look carefully. To listen well. To hear and see and discern. Is this truth? See, if you were to look at a cylinder, end on, it's a circle. If you were to look at a cylinder side on, it's a rectangle. Unless it's a squat cylinder, in which case it would be a square. And that is true. What you are seeing is true. It is a cylinder. It is a, a rectangle or a circle. But it's not the whole truth. And Jesus is calling his followers to not only see what is true for me in my little frame of reference, but to push the boundaries and go, what am I missing? Because to receive the fullness of God, we need to be able to move beyond our construct of what life looks like. Because our construct will never ever be big enough for God. Because God is always bigger. And so there is opportunity no matter where we are in the Christian faith to have our collective understanding stretched. 
our preconceived notions rearranged. That hurt. They'd just been talking with the fellows who had met Jesus on the road to Emmaus and heard their witness that this Jesus was alive. But when he turns up and says, peace be with you, their hearts are troubled. So he says, check it out, boys. Seek the truth. And they do. It reminds me of the passage from 1 John 4, 1, where John, writing to the church, says, test the spirits. And if you think I'm off whack today, go and read your Bible. Go and speak to someone that you recognize as being an elder and a person of wisdom. And test what is being said. Test what is being presented. Not just as sermons, but as lives lived. This is our challenge. We live in a culture that is saturated with voices that say, trust me. With voices that want our blind complicitness to agendas. That's what advertising is. That's what 90% of political rhetoric is. And sadly, too often, that's what our lives are. Either demanding trust from others or offering our trust without wisdom, without discernment. So friends, Jesus offers peace. Jesus challenges us to find peace in these times. And part of the path that he gives us in this encounter is that to find that peace, to recognize the path and the road to peace, we need to look and to seek. And the path for doing that is to draw on what we know, to draw on the scriptures, to listen to the spirit, to consult with those around us. All of these things are part of the discerning process. And Jesus calls us to mission. Part of the finding of peace is being called and doing what God has created us to do. And so friends, we live in a time where many use fear to motivate, to cajole, to bring us into their way of thinking. But that's not the way of peace. The way of peace is the way of Christ. It is fully going where he leads. Here again the words at the end of that passage. This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and, die and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Peace, he says. Peace be with you. Peace, true peace is found in understanding who Jesus is, who we are, and what we're called to. We are called to the mission of God. And that's great. Peace. Embrace it. 
Sit in it. Soak in it. Enjoy it. And remember that this same Jesus who says to these disciples, peace be with you, is the Jesus who says, I come not to bring peace but a sword. This is the Jesus who recognizes that we will sell our soul for fake peace. This is the Jesus who calls us to truth. That's the way to peace. Truth. Not appeasement. Not painting over the cracks. Not redecorating without dealing with the undergirded problems. Peace. Peace is based in the forgiveness of sin. Recognizing and calling out our sin. Challenging the domination and the structures. Now, it would be a lot less hassle just to pretend that everything's all right. But we know what happens when we do that. Neville Chamberlain famously showed us when he came back from his meeting with Herr Hitler, waving his little piece of paper going, I have secured peace in our time. It wasn't peace for the Czechs. It wasn't peace for the Jews in Germany. And in the end, it wasn't peace for the world because Chamberlain didn't have the backbone, the courage and the wisdom to challenge a bully, to challenge evil, to challenge that which was broken. He tried to paper over a structurally unsound world. And when we do that in the church, in our own lives and in our community, we are not bringing peace. We are not being people of peace. We are being ablers and abettors of brokenness and sin. So friends, hear what Jesus has to say in these words. Peace be with you. For peace is ours in him. The path to peace is to seek the truth to discern what is true. It is to confront sin and embrace forgiveness. It is to be a witness to who Jesus is. I love the stories that I hear again and again, of people of faith who hear a niggle from God and they're like, no, God, that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. And the only time they find true peace is when they go, okay, God, I will do it even though I feel like it's not me. What is the niggle God has for you this day? Is it to confess your own sin? Is it to challenge someone else in love? And that's hard. Is it to stand up in a public arena and claim the truth of God? Is it to eat and drink with the oppressed and the downtrodden and the cast out? The scandal of the early church was who was allowed in who was embraced may we embrace embrace the Jesus we see in others embrace the hurting and the lost embrace as we have been embraced may God by his spirit, grant you wisdom this day. Amen.
Let's sing. As we go, consider this. Jesus knew true peace. In the face of outward conflict. Because Jesus had a connection with God the Father. Jesus had the presence of the Spirit in his life. And Jesus knew who he was. And what his role entailed. 1 John 3 reminds us that we are children of God. Heirs of the Father. We are the hands and feet of the mission of God in our day. Live it faithfully, humbly, with the grace and love that God alone can give. And we will find peace. Amen.
dues is to be paid. on us each and every time. Hey! Is with us and with all humankind. Love and recreation always occupies.